Welcome to eMarketing. We're on week three. It's the consumer behavior recap section. And consumer behavior is huge. The internet is big. So we're just going to do a highlights reel and not going to try and teach you the entire subject's worth of stuff in a single session. There are two things that you want to consider though. First, consumer behavior is the theoretical framework. Well, it's the way in which you can explain your experiences. You are a consumer of e-marketing. Across this semester, you're going to do e-marketing things. And we're going to have in the e-portfolio, a self-appraisal, and in the e-taper, we're going to have a, explain how you, as a consumer of this platform, created value for yourself. That's gonna be your question. So, you can draw on consumer behavior theory to explain your own actions. Also, you are running a project which has a target market and a target audience, and CB theory provides you with a whole bunch of different ways to target people. You can use a whole bunch of CB theory to augment and support your segmentation, targeting, and positioning approaches. And lastly, CB theory is really cool and I love talking about it, so let's get in there. And also, I remind you, this is a highlights reel where I'm gonna to point to things and say, CB theory, cool stuff, get on it, go look it up. If you've done the consumer behavior subject with Dr. Egar, awesome. You have just acquired a whole bunch of new friends of anyone who hasn't done Dr. Egar's subject. So I should probably do a little bit of matchmaking on the forums to say, hey, if there's stuff you wanna know, talk to someone who's done the subject. There are two things I want to highlight. One, the consumer decision process model. You're going to spend a lot of time in your own projects getting people towards the choice end of the paddock uh, up here and also a fair bit of time in the information search end of proceedings. This is a useful model and I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to point to it and say this model has a whole lot of implications and applications. Grab yourself a CB textbook, refresh your memory on it, and let's talk a little bit about evaluation and information search as they function on the internet. So the first thing that you want to be aware of is when you create content, like say a video, it is something to be consumed by another. So consumer behavior theory happens. The ways in which you choose to use your platform. So for me, as a creator of content right now, is a consumer behavior experience of a number of different software packages, including PowerPoint over there, OBS down here, my Logitech camera up there, the co-creation of value that comes from my own uh, custom branded t-shirts, and value co-creation and branding. A whole lot of stuff happens. So CB theory can explain a massive number of things. And as I said, you're a consumer of this course, so CB theory can come into effect to help you explain what happened during the course. So I want to pick up some different frameworks and theories along the way. Uh, one of the ones I want to, again, I'm going to mention the Hoffman and Novak uh, 96, because they have this really interesting idea of interaction, and I've used it to design part of the course. And that is the idea of machine interaction on the internet and human interaction on the internet. For the human interaction aspects of the course, we have the live learning events on the Monday and we have the forums throughout the week. Padlet as well, to some extent. The key is, what's the purpose? The purpose is person to person, consumer to consumer engagement in this course. So this is using us as a case study. Which also means that any time that you are sending a direct message to me, you are sending me an email, or you are querying, asking me a question, then that is a human interaction. It's you to the human operator of the course. On the other hand, we have a number of machine interactions that take place within this course, and you're experiencing one right now as you're watching the video. The self-service mode, the software that you use, the apps, the applications, the interaction with the Waddle site, the submission of an assignment to turn it in, the engagement with 
the on-demand content. These are machine interactions. So there's two different approaches here that it's worth being aware of. One is person to person, consumer to consumer, and one is consumer to automated system. Second thing on um, theories to be aware of is customization follows co-creation. If you are modifying the user experience to suit your own needs, you are in perhaps co-production, you are definitely in co-creation. In this course, customization is central to what your experience will be because when you pick your own project and you pick the platform you're going to use, you need to modify the way that platform is default set up in order to give it your own brand name, give it your own image, give it the content that you want it to serve out to other people. And within co-creation and co-customization is also this idea of the features versus costs. Co-creation can be a cost and an expense and a barrier. So if you break open your SIVA framework and you're looking at your accessibility, having to customize everything might not be the advantage. It might not actually be a value, it might be a cost. Equally, that is the have it your way, the DIY set it up how you see fit can be the value proposition in and of itself. So we have it just works versus have it your way. Two different approaches. And from a consumer's perspective, a consumer behavior perspective, these are behavioral factors. These are behavioral assets that we want to be interested in is, is my audience wanting it to be a just works scenario? Content comes to them. Or do they want to have it as a have it your way, they engage with the content and do something with the content. The internet and CB theory, the internet is interest driven. So what I mentioned before that there are sections of internet theory we're going to be approaching and paying attention to. When we're talking about how we engage with the internet, it can be interest driven, which means it's a proactive active process, so we're talking about search driven, we're talking about clicking on a hashtag to follow, we're talking about engaging with the pursuit of your interest. Which means when we go back to the consumer decision making model, we're thinking about things like problem recognition. What is it I'm looking for? Then we've got information search. It does also mean, and I'm going to go a little out on a limb here, this is my view, that if you have curated a set of interests. So if you have a set of subscriptions that you follow, uh, people who you follow on Twitter, the curation of that interest is the curation of a stream of new content from them. So I see that as interest driven. You are pursuing this because it is a mechanism to allow you to chase your interests. That said, if you're going to YouTube and you're just following what comes up on your front page and just following what comes through your feeds, that's less interest driven than if you're up there on the search bar looking for things. Also, it's okay to be curated driven. Uh, passive is literally just content comes to you rather than active, you go to content. Neither is a judgment of moral value or of worth. One is content, one end changes the distribution channel to content comes to me. The other changes the point of access to the distribution channel needs to be accessible and findable by my audience. Now we do know in these days, uh, the internet is badly driven by algorithms. Uh, there's two reasons for this. The first reason is most people writing these algorithms don't have any marketing background whatsoever, and they think they're creating something marketers want. The second reason is, unfortunately, that actually people want old content. And this is one of the things about the Rogers Innovation Adoption Curve, is there is a place for older content to resurface. Constant pursuit of novelty, the fire hose of content, is not appealing to every market. Us shiny chasers of innovators 
We love it. That's what we're here for. New, new, new. But if you're all about the early majority and late majority, which is 60% of the audience, you want the older content. You want stuff that you've seen before come back because that's a feature. That's of value to you. So that is where some of the um, algorithm-driven work has come from, is resurfacing older content. The problem is, algorithm-driven uh, content distribution is very young in terms of its uh, product life cycle, its maturity in the marketplace, and its general capacity to get the job done. So we know that in the future, it's going to be better because in the future, it should take into consideration a shiny chaser like me wants all the new things and doesn't want to see the same Instagram post four times. I want to see, I subscribe to content because I want to see the content. When the algorithm's good enough, the people who subscribe and want to see the content get the content. The people who want old content replayed to them get the old content replayed because the segmentation will have picked up that one's an innovator, there's an early majority, that's a late majority, we will feed appropriately. The other thing to understand about most of the algorithm-driven processes at the moment that are using either machine learning or really ugly spreadsheets is nobody knows how they work. Inside the Research School of Management, we have a spreadsheet that the maintainer, the creator of the spreadsheet is no longer with us. Um, they have left for another university. The maintainer of the spreadsheet for the first couple of years. Also doesn't work for us anymore. They've joined another university. And the current custodian of the spreadsheet doesn't 100% know how it works. Like they can make the top end work, but don't ask them to crack open the code. Multiply that at scale and you have how Facebook and Google have failed to document most of the things that are making the rest of the internet work. Because also, at the end of the day, most of us don't write the documentation of our processes down because that's the innovators who are creating the new processes are too busy chasing new processes and the early majority aren't going to document it because well they don't want to be the ones who lead off and tell other people what to do the internet uh, flow state we haven't mentioned it as much uh, but it's a theoretical framework uh, originally conceptualized outside of the internet by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. It is an older theory that describes that state of mind between a constant stream of challenge and a constant stream of reward. So something is both challenging and you have the skill to address that challenge. You drop into the flow state as you're getting stimulus response, stimulus response. We've turned that into a feature set. So doom scrolling, dopamine hit, dopamine hit, dopamine hit. It is the basis of many dark patterns, that little extra boost of, I'll just finish here, I'll know one more, one more, one more. Uh, I'm as vulnerable to it as any, particularly my video game playing, particularly if you ever play Mount and Blade, it's shocking for just having one more cue to keep you going for that next that next thing. We're using a lot of it at the moment. Uh, a lot, some of the IPO fundraising metrics are time on site and engagement minutes. And the idea is that if you use the flow state to keep the customer on the site, then you can show them more adverts, forgetting that adverts are a break point that break the flow. So this whole idea of content stickiness and flow state, we will use flow state because it is a naturally occurring phenomena. And also, if you've ever been in one of my LEGO Series Play workshops, I use flow state intentionally as a facilitator. So it is beneficial. Uh, it just also can be used for malevolent outcomes. Now, we brought back the decision model because there's a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Now, awareness, we know, we're familiar with. Uh, but there's a couple of things around internet-based search behavior that are interesting, is that we have prompted recall now. To go search something in Google, you need to know that there's something you want to look for. To say, hey Siri, 
you've got to have a query in mind. Alexa, you've got to have a query in mind. You've got to have something you want to do. So problem recognition and evoke set become a key part out of consumer behavior that switches across. What we're increasingly seeing is the creation of the evoked set. And in an evoke set is the difference from a prompted recall. In an unprompted recall, this is advertising and CB theory here, unprompted recall is your ability to surface solutions to a problem to the top of mind. Uh, unprompted recalls, what we want to get you to in terms of your behavioral aspects of marketing. Prompted recall is when there is a reason for you to think about a problem. And problem recognition, problem recall. We use advertising to say, hey, here's a problem, we're the solution. In the evoked set, the evoked set is the ability of a consumer to surface their top solutions to a problem. And in marketing, we often think about it in terms of brands. So say, hey, do you want a cola? Your evoked set of what are colas will have a set of brands that will come straight top of mind to you. A, do you want to grab a drink? Different set because it's in a different evocation. In search, a lot of work is going into creation of evoked sets that you ask Google for something and Google uses the mass, oh, basically the mass capture of search queries to be able to do like for like. People who search this also search that. Uh, this is the basis of the Amazon Firefly recommendation engine of people who like this also like that. Lots of if this then that statements that are then used to evoke and capture a nuanced further refined data set. So if I'm hitting up the Google and going, uh, I need to know about prompted recall, that is my, those are the literal prompts that are showing up in my Google telling me what uh, my next options are. This is also how we have ended up being able to do some very odd quasi prompted recall natural language processing because I can type into Google that 70s cartoon with talking bears and you will see a bunch of choices from my Hanna-Barbera animation of my childhood that feature talking bears and there's more of them than I thought but I was able to evoke the partial query find a response that then gave me a series of prompts that I could further pursue and narrow down. So we've got a really good search function now and an external information search and consumer behavior is very heavily augmented when it's on the internet. For you as marketers, the secret is to be able to be part of the evoked set or a consequence inside the prompted set. Now, uh, I'm going to mention a little thing here. If you have heard anyone on the internet talk about funnels and funnel hacking, they took the IATA model and they rebranded it. Yeah, I, I've got lots of judgment over this, but you don't need to hear that now. Baseline. The IATA model is a really important part of promotion. Awareness, interest, desire, action. Action is the narrow end of the funnel. Getting people to do something, yourselves included, myself included, is a challenge. Given the sheer volume of everything that exists right now, getting someone's attention in the first place. You are in this subject, you have done a search based, you are watching this video because it's week two, week three, week four, it's a pattern, it's a behavior, it's a thing. And what we're looking at here, what the critical piece of information is, on attention, can we find the content we're looking for and can we find it again and then act upon it? So desire is that transformative point of, I like that, I want to know more, or I want that, I'm going to see about buying it. And yeah, I just sits out there as the sales funnel if you've come across it. For us and for you, in your project, desire to action is very important because 
well, kind of being blunt about this, you're going to need to apply this model to yourself. It's very easy when you write an assignment to stay at attention interest. You read around, you go, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah. Or oh, that'd be useful for the assignment. It's that paralysis by analysis, or oh, I'm just going to read one more paper, then I'll start writing. Action is writing. For you and the project, action is creating content for the project. You can tweak around with the stuff as much as you like, but you got to go create the project content so that you've got a project that provides you with the data that you need for the analysis in the e-taper. All right, consumer behavior. Let's talk a couple of theories. Let's talk a couple of frameworks. Bonus points is if you can get to you actually use them for yourself as well as using them on yourself. All right, disclaimer. This, I did my honest thesis on risk. Risk is an area of marketing where there's a lot of work that's been done on risk mitigation and risk reduction, and I'm out here going, risk is as much a value offer, an offering that has value, as it is something to be mitigated as a cost to be minimized in price. Understand risk and understand risk variables and know how it works and make use of them, both in the way you study and engage in your learning of marketing and as a consumer. So let's talk about a couple of the risks. Financial risk. This is top of my list of sell it as a feature. The if your ethics alarm just went off, so did mine. Be conscious of what you are doing. Know that if you are advocate if you're advocating for gambling, rabbit hole effect, loot boxes, in-app purchases, DLC Anything where there is a fear of missing out that can be moderated and mitigated by pressing a button to hand over money off a credit card, there is an ethical ramification to your action. There's also profit. There's ethics, and ethics need to be kept in consideration. This is a fundamental basis for dark patterns. Risk is just that. It may not have a payoff, and the consequence of a, of a non-payoff in a risk event can be pursuit of a larger risk to make up the gap. This is chasing bad money after good, uh, good money after bad in gambling. But financial risk also means that things can be more expensive than you thought they would be. For example, 3D printers. You go out, you buy yourself a 3D printer, and you're like, this is the best thing ever. You get really into creating stuff off your 3D printer, and you realize that you are dropping hundreds of dollars on print material and it's way more expensive like you budgeted the seven hundred dollars for the printer but you hadn't budgeted to be spending that week in week out on the toner so this is where things can be hidden costs then you get sunk costs anytime the money is involved in a calculation of if will my return be greater than what i am outlaying financial risk but also, that can be the very feature somebody is buying from you. Casinos exist because people want to pay money to experience financial risk and uncertainty moderated through random chance and slightly skewed to the house's chance uh, outcomes. Second place, social risk. Fear of missing out. We've mentioned it a few times. You are going to have a bad case of FOMO across this entire subject. Sorry about that, but I'm here to help you get over the fear of missing out and discover the joy of accepting in. And the idea here is that you, in social risk, your actions, your consumption of a product reduces your standing in the eyes of others. Now, this can create out-group and in-group. Again, so social risk can be positioned, moderated, and used as a feature. You can adopt a product for the express purpose of annoying other people. You can elect to pursue content, post content, do stuff, because it will drive away a certain type. And... There's a bunch of different language things. Uh, 
This is also, by the way, the biggest goddamn uh, slippery slope into fascism that you will come across on the internet is intentionally socially ostracizing yourself to be embraced by a group who will then start showing you how all your problems can be solved through fascism. <sighs> no, no, your problems won't be solved through fascism. Fascism caused your problems. But social risk is a way by which you can, as marketers sometimes reduce people's adoption of a product because they're not prepared to do something because they'll be embarrassed by it. But also it's something that uh, makes social comparison information, makes peer review sites, it makes rating sites, it makes IMDB. Uh, the fact that we've got Rotten Tomatoes as a website that shows you the scores of reviews of movies. That entire business model is social risk. Oh. Cats! I really like the movie Cats. I thought uh, 30, it was wonderful. Judgment. Yeah, you're currently judging me. Oh uh, look, Taylor Swift as a furry was not something I th knew that the world needed. Then 2019 happened and I was like, yes, yes, we are about to be doomed, but we're doomed knowing Taylor Swift was dressed as a cat. The judgment of the social risk. Again, social comparison information exists to help. Inside the Rogers Innovation Adoption Groups, if you think about your late majority and early majority, they look for social comparison information. They are driven by the minimization of social risk through the following of leaders and leadership behaviors by the early adopter. The innovators are not very prone to social risks, so they can take all the chances, but acknowledging that they are taking the social ostracism chance of using something before it's been socially endorsed. And then of course, social risk is why we have opinion leaders, because they're the moderators. They're the ones who say, yes this, no that. Uh, fiscal risk and the internet, geez, there's more of it than you think. I still think the funniest thing on the planet was the Tide Pod Challenge, because it wasn't. It was a moral, it was a moral crusade crisis off the back of a Tumblr post where someone posted up one of the those little uh, washing machine things and was like, forbidden fruit. That's how it started. And then someone else made up the story of the Tide Pod Challenge where you're supposed to uh, hold one of these pods in your mouth liquid but no one did it was a lie propagated uh, but it met a very s physical risk became sold as a feature this a bunch of people needed a traction point of a moral crusade a moral crisis to say I'm smarter than another person that person who did the tie pod challenge them youths them use is dumb no no the people who, the journalists and the boomers and the Gen Xers who got overexcited by being able to say, young people aren't as smart as me. <sighs> Bad news. You were, you got play. They got played. But also, fiscal risk. Fiscal risk is a hugely wonderful thing you can sell, and you can sell a lot of it. That there is a YouTube show that is dedicated to watching people harm themselves. Now, your prompted recall brought up a half a dozen different ones then, didn't it, really? I'm thinking about the hot wings, where you get a celebrity to eat chili on live camera. Which is an intentional form of self-harm. They're going out and burning themselves with capsan. They're going past that, and quite often they're going past their fiscal limits, which will cause a variety of food poisoning effects. And they're doing it for the vine. They're doing it on YouTube. So there are a number of, again, in terms of people mocking people, uh, deaths due selfie related injury. Yeah, no kidding. Um, people are doing dumb things for a long period of time. It's just now we've got the footage of them at the end. There are TikTok challenges and something as basic as a TikTok dance routine could result in injury. You know, if I want to do the proper disclaimer thing, I would, I don't, but also, if your content is cooking, 
then you are at risk every time you are going out and breaking out the uh, prep knife and going, ah, good morning friends, welcome to the YouTube show, I'm just going to, oh god, uh, preparation, cooking, tasting food, food poisoning, pro wrestling, I follow quite a number of pro wrestlers, I watch quite a number of pro wrestling shows, it is an at risk, physical risk by feature, lifestyle product, parkour, your purpose is to jump around the place safely, but when it goes wrong, that is an injury in pursuit of content creation. So everything that every content creation challenge that you're looking for has a potential for injury, but not all of it is injury risk you want to reduce. Extreme sport exists for the purpose of going, that is a physical risk I am going to master and overcome. Again, you can sell it as a feature, you can embrace it, you can bring it to your channel, you can make it a feature set. Uh, if you are a sports, if you're doing sport, physical risk is something you will do as part of your job and in your lifestyle channel when you're talking about exercise. Again, at risk. Emphasize there is the ordinary use of the product. Speaking also of things that you can sell as a feature, psychological risk. Let's play videos of horror video games where you get all the adrenaline surges and all the terror and some little voice talking head in the corner also screaming along in fear. I don't play psychological horror games because I don't want to be scared because that's not a feature I'm seeking. Then again, I also play a lot of high speed, fast twitch uh, first person shooters because I look for control. Lack of control. So psychological effects of using a product, standard use. There are a whole bunch of them and they can fit in. Uh, just one thing, don't do jump scares. They're just, they're not good. As in, they're not a good use of psychological risk. Uh, they're just, they don't have a value that is greater than the cost they're going to incur. And we know this from an extended period of it being better to do it in other ways. But psychological effects from using a product. There's also a bunch of things around a what are my perceptions of the losses I could incur by doing this. Now, for some of you, running a social media account is going to be a psychological risk. There's going to be challenges by the nature of the account or having to put yourself out into public. If you don't want that, don't do it. Don't make it a feature. Do it the other way around. Have your cat, okay? Do a blog about your cat. Do a blog about your neighbor's cat. Do what are known as off-screen uh, presence. The how to be make YouTube videos without being seen on YouTube. Me, personally, I'm all about the being on the screen, but I've done enough voiceovers in my life to just do it with the PowerPoint. So, again, it's a feature you can work with. Uh, it's a thing that you're going to have to address when you are doing building up your own um, social media presence. Do you want to face the camera or do you want to be away from the camera? Performance risk. A uh, big part of your course experience. I'm going to tell you now from the outset. One of the reasons I'm asking you to think a lot about what it is you want to get from the subject what it is you want to get from the project, and I want you to be doing these evaluative elements, is that there's a really big opportunity for performance risk to go and impact how you experience the subject. You've come here to study e-marketing. I've asked you to create a project. The project could go horribly right. This could be this massive suddenly, oh my God, I've, you know, I've got millions of followers and I'm feeling all the pressure and I've got assignments due next week, arg, it all went horribly right. Or you've put a lot of effort in, you've planned a lot of things, you've done absolutely everything right on the input side and got no traction in the audience and it hasn't worked. You might feel the performance risk, you might feel that what you expected to have be your outcome against what your outcome actually was. Now, performance risk also can be a preemptive fear of value failure. That you don't buy a product because you don't think 
you don't go to the movie because you don't think you'll enjoy it. You don't listen to the band because you don't think you'll like it. You preemptively go, that won't meet my need. Or rather, you preemptively go, I don't think that will meet my need. Therefore, it's not worth me taking a chance of trying it. There's a difference between knowing you don't like something and going, yeah, I'm not going to consume that product again. I do not enjoy horror movies. I will not consume a horror movie. because, And I find out, oh, that movie is in the horror genre. I'm not interested. It doesn't meet my need. As opposed to going, that is an action adventure movie. I'm not going to go to that, even though I usually enjoy them, because maybe I, can't, I don't want to spend the 90 minutes without but it's something that I would normally embrace. So it's the difference between rejecting a product that you don't want because you know, and rejecting a product on performance risk because you think it might, but you can't, you have no basis to say for certain that it would. So again, preemptive fear. Performance risk is a modifier. I'm not gonna watch this or I'm not gonna follow this because it might, versus I'm not gonna do this because I already know it's not my thing. Anyway. Uh, I'd also like to draw your attention to the weirdest performance risk that exists. And yeah, that's YouTube film reviewers. I have seen far too many times someone get very angry about a movie they enjoyed because they had invested part of themselves and their ego in saying this movie will be bad and it wasn't and now they're angry that they have been tricked into having made a mistake it also helps i've spent a bit of time watching professional wrestling and there's an entire community of people in the professional wrestling youtube video comment sections whose sole anger is driven about enjoying something that they would they wanted to tell other people was bad so please don't base your identity on being the guy and being that guy in the comments section there are it's a small planet it's a big universe there are a lot of active hot plates out there you could put your face on instead of being that guy and you'd have a better day for doing it next theory that's really important to us involvement theory massively important to how we consume social media but also important to the subject and this is the idea of personal relevance and the degree to which personal relevance is going to set off a series of processes. Risk is tied to involvement theory. And every engagement in value co-creation has risk. Every engagement therefore sparks involvement. Involvement also becomes important because a high involvement product or a high involvement person will spend more cognitive processing, more emotive processing, and that in turn will create stronger memories that will drive future experience. Because as we remember from the zone of tolerance, prior experience sets future expectation. And the more that you are embedded the more that you have involvement, high involvement, the more you are going to be driven by stronger emotive and cognitive responses. Which also means that in this subject, the more you put in, the more you get out. Another area I want to talk about briefly, I want to mention some attitudinal messages on the way past. Uh, the Hofstede if you encounter last year's notes, I, we did a bit about uh, the Hofstede stuff. I'm less keen on it this year. But I want to talk about three things that, again, talk about involvement. I had these three models in, and these three elements in my PhD thesis, so I was a little invested in it some 20 years ago. Because also, they're kind of cool. There's a lot of fun stuff in here. I want to mention, just in passing, that when you're doing market segmentation, you can use any consumer behavior theory that is attitudinal. I like to use innovativeness, as I've mentioned a few times, Rogers 1995, the five categories of innovator, uh, or five categories of innovation response. Innovator, 
early adopter, early majority, late majority, lag art. So I find that to be a really useful way to segment audiences. Who's going to go up first because it's shiny? Who's going to be the opinion leader? And who are the followers? Novelty seeking. This is a similar concept of to what extent do you need new things? If you are high on novelty seeking, you like fresh content. You don't want to watch the same thing twice. But if you're low on novelty seeking, then you want to have you are a recurring customer. You want loyalty programs. You want you like classic music stations and classic rock, and you have playlists that you replay. The other thing to understand is that attitudinal measures measure a snapshot in time. They are not permanent constructs, and you can change by domain. So I raised domain specific innovativeness here because I want to mention that the world's a complicated, big and robust place, and you're not always wanting novelty, and you're not always wanting innovativeness, even if in certain areas you score really high. So me. I'm driven by chasing the shiny. I like new technology. I love doing new things in the classroom and teaching and learning stuff. But I play the same video game day in, day out. Uh, when you see the screenshot of my Steam account, you will see that Fights in Tight Spaces, I play it on a daily basis. Uh, because each day there's a new daily challenge. It's giving me a lovely balance between something I'm familiar with and novelty. So, on my music collection, I have a lot of stuff from, I absolutely love um, a German nightclub, HOR, and their mix streams gives me a whole bunch of new music. And also, I'm playing classics from the 80s, 90s, and today. So, what you want to do is be very conscious that you are thinking around a domain. So, in music, in product categories, in product classes. It's not a universal descriptor of an individual, it is a contextual descriptor. The other uh, theory I want to mention, uh, this one's really important for you personally. Across the course of the subject, there is a participation and engagement challenge. There is a task that I want you to undertake. And these two theories are going to help you. The first is the attention to social comparison information. This is where you look to those around you for cues as to how you should interact. It's why Zoom-based classrooms became really difficult for a bunch of educators. When the cameras were off, we were... I, should, I was about to say we, but that's not true. Those who have a high attention to social comparison information can't get that information by looking at the blank screens. Those of us with the low attention to social comparison information don't need that information. So we can talk to webcams without needing to see people responding on the screen. This is something for you to assess amongst, uh, of yourself. To what extent do you need that peer approval? To what extent can you operate independently of it? Because if you need the approval, you'll need to start setting up a culture of cross-validation. You'll need to ensure that the cameras are always on in the breakout rooms so that you can see people's body language and their responses. You'll need to physically modify the way you conduct yourself in a virtual environment. Also, you'll need to work out some way of doing it in the forums, like maybe follow up saying, yeah, I agree, I like that, plus one. Uh, there's a, an upvote function in the Padlet, by the way. On the normative outcomes front, the value here is that this is your self-filtration, self-censorship mode, where you run a judgment call. You look to the information of the room around you and go, to what extent you think this internally, subconsciously processing. If I say, if I make my statement, if I say something, what will the people around me think about me? And you make your decision as to whether you're going to contribute based on what you assume their assumptions are. 
I can tell you now that normative outcomes are beautiful things because most people in the room are too busy worrying about what the people in the room are going to think about them to spend time worrying about what they think about you. It is a recursive loop though. If you are strong on attention to social comparison information, you need that recursive, you need that support. You need to know that people are nodding along. Yes, yes, copy that. If you're high on normative outcomes, you will be self-filtering on the basis of what you think the others will think. But if you're low on the ATSI and you're low on normative outcomes, you will also be like, yeah, well, I'm going to save my mind. And you're not interested or you're not worried by that content. Social media has a whole bunch of different ways. So in attention to social comparison information, some of that ATSI is in fact metrics. Likes, comments, and shares can be translated into social media versions of attention and social comparison information. If you've ever taken down a post because it didn't get enough likes in the first 10 minutes it was up, then that's what your score is. That's, that's who you are and how you operate and you should embrace it and you should work with it knowing that there is a framework that describes how you function. All right, the last area of consumer behavior that's vitally important to understanding is behavioral. And the thing on the behavioral is, I want to talk to a couple of things. One's role experience. Customers are not born equal and customers are not created equal in the pursuit of value co-creation. When you are a neophyte beginner in a co-creation environment, you don't get the most value you can out of something. That's it. Welcome to MKTG 2032. You're not going to get the most value out of the course in the first week compared to what you're going to get out of it by week 12. Same will happen. We'll find our rhythms. We'll get experience in using the forum. Your later forum posts will be different to your beginner forum posts. So role experience is a really important thing to keep in mind both for yourself. When are you the rookie? When are you the newcomer? Particularly if you're going into a community that's been established, you need to, again, attention to social comparison information. Find what the norms are, find what the language are, find out how people react and respond. You may, as an expert customer or an expert performer, go as an expert customer you might know a heck of a lot about something and that can be in and of itself the point of value that you can create through social media like you know more about sports shoes than anybody else you become the broker of knowledge equally you might be very good at co-creation you get the most out of what you're doing all of these are roles and this is something to Pick up this theory and embrace it and make use of it because it can be the guiding point to create content for a social media account, but also it can be really useful in terms of looking back and exploring how did your customer role change within this course over the duration of the course. Think about that for your ePortfolio. All right, theory and application, the last part of the show, I want to talk about the paper and how to use journal articles. So here we've got a paper on a typology paper. Now I've written two typology papers in my life. Uh, surprisingly, that's probably more than most. What they created here in the typology was basically a functional market segmentation. But also by creating this typology, they gave people a set of goals to pursue. So. The eSports player, the type of players, there are five categories, and this is the key idea I took out of this paper, the categorization. <coughs> but also, the way in which multivariate segmentation was used to create. And what's really interesting here is that ranked order of favorite games and game types doesn't change a huge amount between competitive and casual. Call of Duty for casuals, FIFA for filthy competitives. But it's FIFA, Call of Duty, Call of Duty, FIFA. Then it gets different as we go down from three to five. Same again, we see a little bit of clustering here. So what's really useful is that if you 
take a paper like this and you're trying to understand market segmentation, you could reach a competitive and a casual audience by advertising in FIFA because they've got that shared in common. You could reach an exclusive though by going Clash Royale, just getting your competitives and Super Smash Brothers, just to get your casuals. So this is why segments are useful because now you can say, I want to cross over. I'm going to start with casuals, then I'm going to target competitives. What are, what's my boundary? Where can I bring an existing product offer that works for the casuals into something that would pick up the new audience of the competitives? Again, that was a little playing a little amp soft matrix back at you. In terms of using a paper like this, you could use it to justify your choice of how you're doing your segmentation through multivariate segments, or you could justify it through, I want to run, for my project, I want to do an esports account. I would describe myself as casual social because uh, based on Headland's 2021 typology of esports, I play for the connection and the social aspect. So this is why I think it would work for my uh, having a Twitch account and a Twitch stream where I played the game and chatted with people whilst I was playing. Casual social connection, social and sport. And that's how you could justify something through the use of a paper like this. And with that, if you need me, you know where to find me through the forums, off the back of the Padlet, across the socials, direct through the email, or line up a consultation via the Waddle site. And with that, Cheers, mates. It's been a good one.